And since I've come to, to on this tour, I've been working through the rules backwards. And when, I, when I was in North America, I was starting with rule one. It took me a long time. I kept getting stuck on rule one because it was that stand up straight with your shoulders back. And that led me into a fairly lengthy discussion about the inevitability of hierarchies and, and, and the, the, the fact that the political discussion that we all engage in centers at least in part on the fact of hierarchies that would be, and, and their necessity, that would be the right wing position, the conservative position, let's say, and the tendency for hierarchies to become corrupt and dispossess people at the bottom, and that would be the left wing position. And we need to continually have a discussion between those two positions because, because hierarchies are inevitable and necessary if you want to solve complex problems in a social environment, but they tilt towards tyranny and blindness and they do tend to dispossess people at the bottom of the hierarchy. So sometimes the hierarchy needs to be strengthened because it's decomposed and so we're not solving complex problems very effectively and sometimes the hierarchy needs to be adjusted and loosened because it's got too tight, too hard to climb and it isn't serving its proper purposes anymore. Anyways, that's a very complicated argument, although that was a relatively straightforward summary of it. Um, since I've come here, I've been working through the rules backwards. Um, and I've got to rule six, and that's the one that I'm going to discuss with you tonight. And I think it's the, it's the shortest chapter in the book, rule six, which is put your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. I think it's actually set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. And it's a meditation on the motivation for evil. And, and, and so you can understand why, not necessarily why that would be the shortest chapter, but by what, by, by, but what it might, why it might be the most challenging, because it's such a dark topic. And so I was sitting backstage juggling ideas, thinking, okay, how am I going to approach this idea of malevolence and, and what might be done about it most appropriately? And I wove a bunch of things together relatively quickly. I mean, there are things that I've been working on for a long time, so uh, the weaving is quick, but the ideas behind it aren't. And I'm going to sit down in this chair, and, and I'm going to talk to you a bit extemporaneously, but I'm going to also rely on some notes that I made, because there's some things I want to read you that are very precisely formulated, and so, um, and I don't have a great memory for quotations, so, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to do a deep analysis of this idea that you should put your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. And I want to explain what that means psychologically. I'd also like to make a case that it's actually, it's, see one of the things I've come to realize in this lecture tour with regards to rules and regulations and responsibility, let's say, which is a central theme in 12 rules, that you need rules obviously because why else write a book called 12 rules? And people in our culture, especially over the last four, four decades, five decades, I would say, have started to view rules as nothing but limitation to their freedom, and that their untrammeled freedom is an unquestioned good, and that any limitations to that freedom are essentially have the nature of tyranny. And that's just simply not true. I mean, you do have a responsibility, and part of your responsibility is, in some sense, to abide by rules. Um, but it's not only because that's a duty, and it's certainly not because it's nothing but a negative limitation on freedom. A lot of responsibility, and, and let's say rule following, for, for lack of a better word, rule abiding, that's a better phrase, is actually aspirational. You know, the thing about structure, especially if it's associated with value, is that it gives you something to do. And this is the problem with the idea that hierarchies are bad in essence or that they should be deconstructed. It's like, well, a hierarchy is a hierarchy of value that posits that one thing is preferable to another. Well, and, and a hierarchy means, is also a judgment as a consequence, right? Because if there's a hierarchy of value and one thing is better than another, then some things are worse than others and those things that are worse are judged by those things that are better and that dispossesses people and might be hard on their feelings as well. You know, if you fail at something, then 
well, that's painful, and one thing you can do is rectify your failure, and the other thing you can do is criticize the structure that gave rise to the idea that behavior such as yours constitutes a failure. And that's a pretty easy way out in some sense, except you also lose the perceptual structure that the hierarchy grants you, and that's a major loss. That's the loss of a value structure. It's no joke, because it, it leaves you with nothing. It leaves you in an in enemy, and, and it, it leaves you in chaos. It leaves you without forward direction. And the thing about life, human life, is you, you can't exist. Um, you can't exist. I don't think you can exist. That's, that's the right way to think about it. You can't exist without a forward direction. And so you can't sacrifice hierarchies of value for convenience because it leaves you with nothing. And the, I guess that's not exactly true either because we're never left with nothing if we're alive. You know, because life in the absence of something worth doing isn't nothing. It's just pain and anxiety. And so what it leaves you with is p pain and anxiety as uh, the ineradicable meanings of life, confusion and directionlessness. And that's the consequence of demolishing, casually demolishing hierarchies of value, or even questioning the idea of value. You know, one, one of the things Nietzsche said when, when he talked about the death of God, said, the collapse of a belief system leaves you lost. This is a paraphrase, obviously. Leaves you lost because the value system gave you a direction, an orientation, and structure. And, and then if that collapses, the belief in God, say, the collapse of Christianity, which was what Nietzsche was commenting on, then there's, there's a nothing that replaces it. But then he went farther. He said, it's, it's not just that you're left with nothing. It's, it's worse than that. Because if you lose faith in one system of value, it might, not only be not, it might not only be the case that you lose faith in that system of values, but you lose faith in the idea of systems of values as such. And then that's like a meta-catastrophe, because not only do you not believe anymore, and you need to believe in order to have the faith to move forward, so not only do you not believe anymore, but you don't even believe that belief is possible. And then I would say, in some sense, that's the postmodern condition. That's the skepticism of of, of meta-narratives, which, which I have plenty of trouble with. Well, one being, how do you distinguish between a meta-narrative and a narrative? And that's a real problem, given that the structure, the very structure of your thinking is in fact narrative. And so to be skeptical about narratives is to be skeptical about thought itself. And that's the same as being skeptical about action, because thought is the precursor to action. So it's, 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 a, it's a hypothesis that, that well, let's say it runs into some rather thorny practical problems. But in any case, I'm very interested in why people's belief systems collapse and, 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 and certainly understand why they might, and also interested in the process by which they might be reconstructed on solid ground, because I do believe that there is solid ground on which belief systems can be constructed. And that's what I want to cover tonight. And it's difficult. So I'm going to have to do some reading and some, some direct thinking. And so we'll see how that goes. So, so that's the plan anyways. All right, so this is directly from 12 Rules for Life, from the first part of chapter six. Set your house in perfect order. It's subtitled, A Religious Problem. It does not seem reasonable to describe the young man who shot 20 children and six staff members at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut in 2012 as a religious person. This is equally true for the Colorado Theater gunman and the Columbine High School killers. But these murderous individuals had a problem with reality, that it existed at a religious depth. As one of the members of the Columbine duo wrote, the human race isn't worth fighting for, only worth killing. Give the earth back to the animals. They deserve it infinitely more than we do. Nothing means anything anymore. People who think such things view being itself as inequitable and harsh to the point of corruption, and human being in particular as contemptible, 
they appoint themselves supreme adjudicators of reality and find it wanting. They're the ultimate critics. The deeply cynical writer continues, if you recall your history, the Nazis came up with a final solution to the Jewish problem. Kill them all. Well, in case you haven't figured it out, I say, kill mankind. No one should survive. For such individuals, the world of experience is insufficient and evil. So to hell with everything. What is happening when someone comes to think in this manner? A great German play, Faust, a tragedy, written by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, addresses that issue. The, play, the play's main character is a scholar named Heinrich Faust, who trades his immortal soul to the devil, Mephistopheles. In return, he receives whatever he desires while still alive on earth. In Goethe's play, Mephistopheles is the eternal adversary of being. You could say in some sense that he's the literary representation of the spirit that inhabited the Columbine killers. You could say, that, you could say the same thing about the person who shot up Sandy Hook Elementary. No, if you, if you dwell long on terrible things, then something terrible comes to inhabit you. And human beings are capable of being possessed by ideas. And ideas can be thousands of years old. And ideas that are thousands of years old tend to have the structure of personalities. That's a good way of thinking about them. And so if you dwell long in terrible places, then a, thousands, a, a personality of evil that's thousands of years old can come to inhabit you. You're capable of being the dwelling place for that, for that complex system of conceptualizations. People have been thinking about the nature of evil for a very long time and have I've thought about it as something embodied, and that makes sense, of course, because it's something that's acted out, and it comes complete with a conceptual scheme. It comes complete with its own opinions, and its own emotions, and its own motivations, and its own rationales, all of that. And it's best to think of that as a personality. One of the things I really like about the psychoanalysts, and this is something that I think the, the cognitive scientists haven't yet figured out, although the ones who work more on the level of emotion and motivation are coming close, is the psychoanalysts figured out at the beginning of 20th century, that ideas were alive, that they inhabited human beings like sub-personalities, and that if you were troubled in some particular way, it was as if you were possessed by some complex, and that was the psychoanalytic term, and a complex would be something like an autonomous, quasi-autonomous sub-personality that would, that would, that would, that you had granted access you had granted that sub-personality access to yourself, or it had somehow taken you over. Now, this isn't an uncommon experience. Everybody knows this. It's just we don't articulate it that well. You know, you, you, you know perfectly well that when you're angry, you're a different person than you are when you're calm. And the more disintegrated you are as a person, psychologically, the more different you are when you're angry than when you're not angry. And when you're angry, you, you know, you think about being angry as you have a point. So, so there's a purpose to your anger, which is usually something approximating destruction or defeat. And then there's a set of emotions that go along with that, mostly rage, but, 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 but also a certain amount of pleasure, by the way, because anger is an emotion that activates both positive and negative emotion systems, which is part of what accounts for the self-righteous sense that might accompany anger. There's been good neuropsychological studies done of emotional response during anger. But then there's also uh, a philosophy that goes along with it and, and memories that go along with it. Like if you're fighting with someone that you love, you're having a very acrimonious argument, it can easily be the case that the only thing that you can, the only memories that you can bring to mind about their behavior in the past are those memories that are precisely as irritating as whatever it is that's driving you towards the fight at the moment. And so there's a, because the anger turns you into something that's somewhat unidimensional, only what you know that feeds that unidimensionality comes to mind. And so it's very useful to think of it as a personality. And this also is very useful if you're trying to understand what archaic people meant by deities or gods, because these gods, like anger is a god, it's Ares or Mars, that's a good way of thinking about it. It's the god of rage, and it can possess you. And, and, 
And the reason that it was conceptualized as a god was because it's a transpersonal force. It, like, you're not the creator of anger, and you may not be the master of anger either. It could easily be the other way around, that anger is the master of you. And then the question is, well, what is this anger that's the master of you? And it is at least in part a personality, and it's a personality that transcends you as an individual, because everyone experiences anger, even animals experience anger. And so it's something ancient and archaic. And as we come to understand anger and express it in, in, in many different ways, and watch other people become angry, and see how it's fictionalized and and portrayed in art and literature, we come to have an expanded sense of what the personality of anger might constitute. And then when we become angry, then we can manifest all of those different elements of what it means to be angry. You know, they say in the United States that as the movie industry has concentrated more and more over the decades on organized criminals, mafia types, that the mafia types have come to represent ha, movie mafia types more and more in their actual behavior. And that's a good example of precisely that. Art feeding life and life feeding art. And, and anger is one personality that's transpersonal and love is another that's transpersonal and jealousy. But, but the, 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 figure, the figure of evil itself is one of the ultimate transpersonal, transpersonal entities. And so that's partly what we're going to talk about tonight. Now, that was Faust's, that was, that was Goethe's idea in Faust when he was trying to understand the nature of evil and he embodied it as a, as, a, as, a, as a personality, the adversary of being. And the question is, what would be the fundamental uh, motivation of the great adversary of being? And, and, and this, is, this is a psychological question and a personal question as well as a literary and theological question because there will be times in your life where you're opposed to the idea of existence itself. And I, I think this is a common experience for everyone. When when people despair, and that despair turns into resentment and bitterness, you question the very utility of not only your life, and, and of course that leads into something approximating suicidal ideation, but that can also drive homicidal tendencies or even genocidal tendencies. And there's something underneath that too, which is deeper than mere suicide or mere homicide or mere genocide, which is the hatred for the idea of existence itself, especially limited suffering existence. And that's what Goethe was attempting to express. And so his, his words for Mephistopheles, the great adversary of being, were this. I am the spirit who negates, and rightly so, for all that comes to be deserves to perish wretchedly. It were better nothing would begin. And he has, years later, Goethe wrote the second part of Faust, and he had Mephistopheles repeat that credo in different words, but with exactly the same the thesis. And the thesis is it's a very straightforward thesis. It's a very powerful thesis. It, and it's definitely one that each of us contends with. Perhaps existence is structured such that the suffering that it entails makes the whole game suspect. And that it would in fact be better if nothing existed in preference to something. And if you're become desperate enough in your life, and there will be times when that's a high probability, then some variant of that idea will enter your thinking. And that's certainly the case in the situation of the people who I just described that did the particular, particularly terrible things that they did. You can't understand the motivation of someone like the Columbine High School shooters without understanding the level at which they were seeking revenge. It wasn't personal. It wasn't social. It wasn't a matter of being bullied at school. They'd gone way beyond that, absolutely way beyond that, to elevate themselves to the position of the judge of all being and to make the determination that it would be better if everything could be punished for the crime of its, ex of its existence. And you might not think that high school students could be sophisticated enough to come up with such conceptualizations, but you're perfectly welcome to go online and read the writings of the killers themselves. And you'll find some things there that will make the hair stand on, on the back of your neck if, you're, if you understand what's being written, that's for sure. Now, in Dostoevsky's book, um, The Brothers Karamazov, there's a, a character, Ivan, who's the older brother of the main character, um, the main character is a, a monastic novitiate, and he's a good person, 
he's kind of a simple person, which is often the case in Dostoevsky's stories, like the idiot, in, in, the main character in The Idiot is a Christ-like figure, but by no means an intellectual giant. His, his virtue is in, is in his action, in the simplicity and straightforwardness and honesty of his action, whereas Ivan Karamazov is definitely a figure of, of towering intellect and, and charisma and, and, and worldliness. And, and so he's, he's the dominant character in some sense. And one of the things that's so remarkable about Dostoevsky's book, especially the Brothers Karamazov, is that Ivan wins all the arguments but loses the war. And the reason that he loses the war is because he wins all the arguments but his brother, Alyosha, has a better life. Like a more, a more, a more, a more moral life. And despite the fact that he can't articulate the rationale for the morality of his life. And so, it gives, gives Dostoevsky an advantage in some sense over Nietzsche because Dostoevsky could dramatize what virtue looked like in the face of overwhelming intellectual criticism and have the virtue win despite the fact that at the intellectual level the, the, the criticism wins. And so Ivan is always criticizing Alyosha for his simplicity and his belief in God and Alyosha isn't really up to the task of defending himself and no wonder because it's indefensible in some sense. I mean, it's become indefensible in the modern world to, to what, make a rational case for God. It's like good luck, for, good luck with that. It's very, very difficult, especially in the face, say, of the scientific revolution, but far more than that, in, in the face of a kind of an overweening cynicism about the structure of reality, and also about, uh, in the face of tremendous confusion about what it might even mean for there to be something divine. So anyways, Ivan is after Alyosha one day and about his belief in God, and he lays out these stories that Dostoevsky took from actual newspapers of the time, and they were, they were, um, they were stories of suffering, essentially, and Ivan pick a particular form of suffering, which is, I suppose, uh, particularly unbearable for anybody who has any sense of compassion um, and, and fair play. And, and he talked about uh, a, a, a girl, a young girl, who, and as I said, this was a real story, who had been, she was four years old, I believe, and her parents were very cruel and apparently weren't very positively predisposed to her, to say the least. Um, and they locked her in the outhouse overnight for some infraction and she beat on the walls and, and was screaming about and, and crying about being out there in the cold and the neighbors heard but no one did anything about it and she was praying to Jesus to save her and she froze to death and um, Karamazov Ivan faces Alyosha with this story and says um, do you think that the entire structure of being is worth having one little girl like that tortured to death in that manner? He said, would you do that? And of course, Alyosha has no answer to that. And Ivan's response is, well, it's not even so much that being is therefore unjustified. It's, it's more than that because Ivan isn't a atheist in the standard sense. He's sort of a meta-atheist. He doesn't not, it isn't that he, it isn't that he, it isn't that he has no belief in God, it's that he doesn't approve of God. And, and that's a different thing. And, and he uses his, these stories, which are very powerful stories, the stories of the unjust suffering of children, to indicate that if there is a God, then he's certainly a morally reprehensible creature. And, and Alyosha is basically what, driven to silence in the face of that, and unsurprisingly, because it's not so easy to formulate something coherent that justifies the suffering of innocent children, right? It's a permanent existential problem. How is it that the world could be constituted in that manner? So, so that's, that's, that's something. And I would say that Mephistopheles' credo is best justified by precisely that set of observations. And now the danger, of course, is that if you draw the conclusion that being as such is something so corrupt that it deserves to be eradicated, then you may come to act in that manner, which is of course what people like the Columbine killers did, and on a much larger scale, people like, let's say, Hitler and Stalin, who were motivated, I believe, at the deepest level by the same, by possession, by exactly the same credo. You certainly see that with Stalin, with his immense contempt for people, and also with Hitler, especially as World War II advanced and the Germans started to lose the war, because by the end he believed that 
the German nation itself deserved nothing but to perish, which as I presume was his hope from the beginning, uh, because we don't have to take him at his word. And he was very attracted to fire and destruction and the idea of purification through death. And so it's certainly possible that it was possession of that type that drove both Hitler and Stalin to do what they did. Uh, their large scale revenge on God for the crime of existence. And so a question emerges out of that, which is whether or not evil is to be attributed to God. And, and it, I think this is a question, you see, I don't think, I don't think that you need to be, I don't think that you need to believe in God in order to be troubled by this question, because it doesn't really matter at this level of analysis whether you believe in God, because you will find that there will be times in your life where you act as if God exists, whether or not you believe in him, and that's often the case, I would say most commonly the case, when you're absolutely desperate, and maybe when that desperate desperation has boiled over, spilled over into resentment and hatred, because you will find yourself acting out the great drama of doubt about the Creator's goodness, something like that, even if you don't, if you, even if you wouldn't articulate it in that manner. You'll play out the drama, and so you still have to ask, you still have to answer the question. And my conclusion after thinking about this for many years is that tragedy can be attributed to God, but not evil. And so now I'm going to talk about why I think that's the case. So the first thing is, I'm going to talk a little bit about the story of Adam and Eve, and so, and what I think it means psychologically. Um, it's a very interesting story, uh, which is why we haven't forgotten it for many thousands of years, right? Because it's sort of the definition of interesting that you don't forget it. And so, you might think about a story like that as a maximally interesting story. You might even think about that's you might even think that that's why it came to be, because it's a maximally interesting story. It's so interesting we can't forget it. Now, why that is, that's a whole different question, and I'm not going to go into that tonight, although I think there are answers to it, but we'll, we'll proceed on the assumption that it's interesting enough to be, not to be forgotten, and for almost everyone to know it, and we'll use that as evidence that it's not forgettable, and so it's memorable, and that there's a reason for that. Um, I think it's memorable because it it describes something that we cannot describe any better, that needs to be described. So what happens in the story of Adam and Eve? There's many things, but we'll concentrate only on the rise, on the part of the story that I believe indicates, is indicative of the rise to self-consciousness. Now what happens is that man, Adam and Eve are naked in the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden is the human environment. It's, it's the ultimate balanced combination of culture and nature. That's the walled garden, right? The walls and the garden. Culture, the walls, and nature, the garden. And that's the human environment because we don't just live in nature, obviously, because we just die in nature. And we can't just live in culture because we need nature, and so we have to balance the two. And a great metaphor for the balance between nature and culture is a garden. And so that's a perfectly reasonable representation of the dwelling place of human beings. And initially, we dwelled in that garden in unconscious, in unconsciousness, or at least in unself-consciousness. Now, the, the dividing line between those two things is not so easy to draw, um, but it's certainly the case, partly because, you know, human beings are clearly conscious, and, and animals appear to be conscious as well, although perhaps that conscious is on, consciousness is on some sort of gr gradation um, with, from, from, from lower to higher. It's hard to tell, because animals can do some very intelligent things. But it doesn't seem like there is any evidence that's credible that animals are really self-conscious. He had trivial evidence like the fact that if you put lipstick on a chimpanzee and you show it a mirror, then it sometimes can notice that it has lipstick, and that's sort of self-consciousness. But it's really reflexive self-consciousness, whereas the self-consciousness that human beings possess is of a much richer and detailed kind, because not only can you recognize yourself as an individual entity separate from other individual entities, but you have a theory about your own being, a, a, very, a very thoroughly developed, fantastical, imagistic theory of your own being that's laid out, say, in dreams, and then an articulated theory of your own being. And then also, on top of that, knowledge of your 
borders and your boundaries, which is the critical aspect, not so much whether you can recognize yourself in a mirror, but the fact that you know that you're finite in time and space, which is the critical element of self-consciousness because it defines your limits as a being, right? You, you once weren't and then were, and once and at some point, point won't be, and it's the consciousness of that boundary that surrounds you that's like the boundary of your body except the temporal extension of that that really makes you self-conscious and so Adam and Eve are clearly not that to begin with and the serpent tempts Eve into eating this apple, this fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil which is a very strange tree and a, a very strange fruit and a very strange tempter to say the least and, and one of the great mysteries is why the fruit is that the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because it's not obvious how the ingestion of this particular delicacy let's say results is is associated with knowledge of good and evil and so this is something that I did write about in 12 rules for life that took me decades to figure out um, and it's it's it was a discovery that I would say shook me to the core because I think it's so crucial and I think it's actually quite it's quite easy to understand you already know it, but you don't know you know it, and so when you hear it, then you know that you know it, and that's even worse than merely knowing it. Um, so Adam and Eve, Eve takes the fruit and eats it, and, and the scales fall from her eyes, and then, of course, she shares it with her husband, who, who, is, who is equally in, in, enticed, let's say, to devour it, and the scales fall from their eyes, and their eyes open, which implies that their eyes were closed to begin with, and that's the unconsciousness that I was discussing and the first thing that happens or one of the first things that happens is that they both realize they're naked and that's often given a sexual connotation and, and there's utility in that but that's not the fundamental issue as far as I'm concerned like you know if you have a nightmare that you're naked on stage which is a fairly common nightmare then that, that's not sexual I mean there might be a sexual element in it maybe you're afraid that people will make fun of your endowment let's say that you know but 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 it, it's deeper than that, it's that to be naked on stage is to have your limited self subject to unmediated evaluation by the group. And so that's rather terrifying, it's partly why people don't like public speaking as well, especially if they're actually saying what they mean, because then they have who they are laid bare for the evaluation of the group. And that's, that's, that's knowledge of, that's nakedness, that's knowledge of nakedness, and the nakedness is, well the nakedness is the vulnerability to, to know that you're naked is to know that you're vulnerable, is to understand your, is to understand your limitations. And with human beings, I think part of the reason for that, and maybe part of the reason that that actually developed, is because of our stance. You know, like most animals are, of course, on four legs, and um, they're the most vulnerable parts of them are all actually armored. In, in, in the mammalian community anyways, they're armored because they have the, their back covering the vulnerable front parts of them, right? But human beings, we stand upright and one of the consequences of, of that is that everything about us, so to speak, and certainly the most centrally vulnerable parts of us, physiologically speaking, even metaphysically speaking for that matter, are subject to public evaluation. And, and not only public evaluation, but to, but to harm, because you can certainly be with open like this, I mean, we're, we're, we're not rhinoceroses, you know, we're, we're, we're not armored, we're very vulnerable creatures, and when you become self-conscious, then you become aware of that vulnerability, and then that's like a meta-vulnerability, not only are you vulnerable, but you know it, and so not only do, can you then experience pain, but you can experience anxiety, and not just anxiety in the trivial sense, but anxiety in the long-term permanent sense, knowing that no matter how comfortable you are right now, and how well constituted your life is at the moment, that all of that can break apart at any moment and leave you with nothing and leave you dead and that and that everything around you can disappear and that's all a consequence of the knowledge of your limitation and that's in some sense why death enters the world and the consequence of that is that Adam and Eve clothe themselves right they put an intervening structure between them and the terrible world both social and natural and it's only clothing in the in the it's only a leaf in the in the story but it's symbolic of the well, you're all clothed. It's, it's symbolic of that. There's a reason for that. I mean, it's warm in here. You don't have to be clothed, but you certainly are. And you have been for a very long time. It's tens of thousands of years that people have worn clothes. 
to protect themselves against the elements for sure, for sure, but also to protect themselves against their own harsh self-judgment and the judgment of others. And that's partly the intermediation of culture against nature. And it's symbolic of that as well, is because once you understand that you're vulnerable in some permanent sense across time, then you're liable to work. And of course, that's the next thing that happens in the story of Adam and Eve, is that God finds out what happens. One of the next things that happens, God finds out that Adam and Eve are now self-conscious. And he says, oh, 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 now you're in trouble. You're going to have to work. I said, why do you have to work if you're self-conscious? And the answer is, well, you might have everything you need now, but that doesn't mean you're going to have it in the future. And so there's no escape from that. You have to work, you have to sacrifice the present for the future, because now you're aware of the future. And the definition of work, in some sense, is the sacrifice of the present for the future, to forego gratification. If it's merely spontaneous pleasure, we don't define it as work. Work is when you're doing something for later that you'd rather not do now. And why would you do that? Well, it's because you know that you extend across time. And even if it's not you, maybe it's your family that extends across time. You're vulnerable on all fronts. And so you're going to work. And that's that. And so, well, and then of course, the other thing that happens is that people become aware of the difference between good and evil. And, 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 and that's, that's, that's attributed there's a godlike element that's attributed to that. What God actually says after Adam and Eve eat the fruit and become aware of good and evil, he says, well, we have to remove them from paradise unless else they eat the fruit from the tree of life and live forever and be like God, gods themselves. They're halfway there with their knowledge of good and evil. You say, well, what's going on? How is it that the ingestion of whatever this was, I mean, and, and food is often a metaphor for knowledge. It's... it's to ingest or to, to you, and, and you might have received a bit of indigestible news. That's a good way of thinking about it. Um, the idea of incorporation of food and the idea of incorporation of knowledge are very tightly linked. And the reason for that, at least in part at the metaphorical level, is part of the reason that you want to incorporate knowledge is so that you can incorporate food, right? Is knowledge is actually this, knowledge is actually the abstract representation of the food that will, that will sustain you across very large periods of time. I mean, it's more than that, but it's certainly that. So there's a very tight relationship between us foraging for knowledge, which we do, and something very specific about human beings that we forage for knowledge. And that foraging for knowledge is partly what enables us to maintain ourselves biologically across long spans of time. It's like squirrels forage for nuts, and then they have to remember where the nuts are. And then the remembrance of where the nuts are is equivalent to the food. And the knowledge and the food are the same thing. And so, and then there's the food that you can eat today, and then there's the food that will sustain you for the rest of your life, and the knowledge is the food that sustains you for the rest of your life, and that's why man does not live by bread alone. That's why that works out. So, Adam and Eve realize that they're vulnerable, and, and they realize that they're, that, and that death enters the world at that point, the knowledge of death. So, the vulnerability is, is final in some sense. It's cataclysmic. It destroys the structure of reality. That's what that story means. And there's something about that, you know, because we're very complex creatures, us human beings. There's nothing more complex anywhere than what's inside your skull. The brain is immensely, immeasurably the most complicated thing that there is. And at some point, it gathered the power to reflect upon itself. And the story in Genesis is partly predicated on the idea that that put a cataclysmic rift in the structure of reality. Now, it depends on how you define reality, but the most complex thing that exists might have something crucial to do with the structure of reality. At least you can make that case. <laughs> and whether it does or not, in some objective sense, whatever that might mean, <laughs> it certainly does as far as you're concerned. And so that's of sufficient importance and so what happens when you realize that you're vulnerable? Well, something very interesting. And this is where the idea of good and evil enters the world. Because, you know, maybe you're hungry, and maybe you're hungry like a lion, and when you're hungry like a lion, you rouse yourself out of your torpor, because most of the time, lions just sleep, except when they're hungry. And then when they get hungry, they organize themselves, and they go hunt, and they take down a zebra, and then they eat the zebra, and that's the end of that, and it's a little hard on the zebra, but there's no malevolence in it, you know, there's no casual slaughter, they're certainly not dragging out the torment of the zebra, 
You know, they're just eating. And so it's tragic, certainly for the zebra, but it's not malevolent. An animal that does something carnivorous does it by necessity. But humans can do something carnivorous out of far more than necessity. And the reason that they can do that is because they actually understand their own vulnerability. And the flip side of that is that as soon as I understand my own vulnerability, I have some sense of how I can be hurt and what makes me terrified and anxious. As soon as I know that for me, I also know it for you. And as soon as I know it for you, then I can use it. And that's how the knowledge of good and evil enters the world with the revelation of vulnerability. And because now you have within you the power to take that knowledge of the misery of the world and to utilize it in any way that you see fit. And so that's why human beings are capable of malevolence because they can take that which they hate, which is far, something far darker than mere predatory behavior, and subject it to endless creative torment and that might be something that you apply to yourself and it might be something that you apply to your family and it might be something that you apply to your community and now and then it might be something that you directly apply right that you're directly engaged in precisely that malevolence which is the exploitation of vulnerability and if it's truly malevolent it's exploitation of vulnerability merely for the aesthetic joy of doing so and, you know you see this dark humor that satirical humor that goes along with great acts of malevolence like this gate sign over the Auschwitz concentration camp work will set you free right some some great cosmic joke that could only be written by the spirit of evil itself to to de demarcate a place where if there was work all it was done was to parody work for the purpose of the violence and destruction that it could produce prior to death and so that's the depths of malevolence, and there's no doubt that exists, that's for sure. And so, and so then the question, I suppose, is, well, people became self-conscious and they became capable of malevolence, and is that something that you can lay at the feet of God? And so that's something that Milton was very interested in, in Paradise Lost, his great poem. And so, and it's a poem that's very much worth reading if you, if you understand what it's about, and it's about free will and it's about evil and it's about it's about this great narrative that we're embedded in that we don't understand that's part and parcel of the biblical corpus let's say but it's also part and parcel of all the great plays and dramas and, and literary productions and musical productions and and cathedral like architecture and 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 the dream all of that artistic endeavor that's part of the dream in which are articulated cognitive structures are embedded and that's that's what Milton is trying to understand it's the structure of that underlying dream because you're embedded in a dream you have to dream every night or you can't maintain your sanity your your articulated cognition has to dissolve into the dream that surrounds you in order to maintain its sanity and the underlying metaphysics of our culture expressed at least in part in stories like the biblical corpus constitute the dream upon which our sanity depends even though we don't know that and you see people like Milton who are great poets who are who are geniuses of the imagination who are playing in the realm of dreams trying to sort things out at a level that's far below articulated cognition to wrestle with questions that are so deep that they trouble all of us but that none of us are intelligent enough to articulate our way through and that's why you study literature and poetry, if you have any sense, because it pushes you down into that dream where you can, where you can straighten out the metaphysics upon which your more formal theories of being definitely rely. Something has to buffer us. Something has to serve as a buffer between our limited knowledge and the unknown itself. And it's... It's the dream that surrounds us that constitutes that buffer and it has to be maintained in order. And that's what poets and artists and, 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 and philosophers, if they're deep, and sometimes psychologists, that's what they do. And I'm thinking about people like Jung and Freud when I'm thinking about that. So, this is God's discussion of, of the emergence of evil in the world and his his attempt to reconcile his attempt to justify I would say in some sense 
the structure of being, even given that malevolence made its emergence on the stage. And he's talking about the relationship between Adam and Eve, but mankind in general, and the spirit of evil as such, which might be that proclivity to seek revenge on existence for the tragedy of being. For man will hearken to his glozing lies and easily transgress the sole command, sole pledge of his obedience. So will fall he and his faithless progeny. Whose fault? Whose but his own? Ingrate. He had of me all he could have. I made him just and right, sufficient to have stood, though free to fall. Such I created all the ethereal powers and spirits, both them who stood and them who fell. Freely they stood who stood and fell who fell. So that's a fairly straightforward hypothesis that evil beckons but that people have within them what would be necessary if they drew upon it to resist it. And the existence of evil, the manifestation of evil in the world can therefore not be laid at the feet of God. Now, perhaps it's an argument that you don't buy, but it's an argument and it's a strong one. And then there's another justification you know, Milton wrote Paradise Lost. He said he wrote Milton's Paradise Lost to justify the ways of God to man. Which is, that's quite an ambition. It's a hell of a thing for someone to say, especially given that he meant it. And so, here's another section from book two. Why would you allow people the choice to indulge in evil? Why, why, why grant the power of free will? Because perhaps that's free will, is the power to choose between good and evil. It seems to be the most fundamental definition of free will. I else must change their nature. And revoke the high decree, unchangeable, eternal, which ordained their freedom. They themselves ordained their fall, self-tempted. Self-depraved. And one more, and perhaps this is more relevant to freedom to choose the good rather than evil. What pleasure I from such obedience paid when will and reason, reason also is choice, useless and vain of freedom both despoiled, made passive both, had served necessity, not me. They therefore as to right belonged, so were created. Nor can justly accuse their maker, or their making, or their fate, as if predestination overruled. So the next story in Genesis is the, is the story of Cain and Abel. And it's a very interesting story. It's a very short story. It's only a few lines long. I, I don't, I've never encountered a story that has it, that much depth packed into that tiny amount of space. It's absolutely unfathomable in some sense. And so I'll, I'll, I'll go over the story briefly. The first thing is, is that, well, Adam and Eve are the mother and father of us all. And so you could say, well, if you were thinking about it symbolically, maybe from the Jungian perspective, that Eve is the personification of nature itself, and Adam is the personification of culture itself, and each of us is the child of nature and culture. And then the question is, well, what is the fundamental nature of the child of nature and culture? And the answer is Cain and Abel, the hostile brothers, the first two real human beings, because they're born in the standard manner, 
They're not made by God. They're real. And it's a terrible story because it's a story of, of murder and worse. And so that's the first story of mankind. And, and this is the story. So there's Cain and there's Abel. And uh, Cain is the firstborn and Abel is the secondborn. And there's a reason for that, but we won't go into that. And they're both working in the world. They have to work because work has entered the world. And um, Cain is a, a farmer and Abel is a shepherd. And, and a shepherd is no trivial thing. It's not a little Bo Peep. You know, a few thousand years ago, if you were guarding sheep, there were wolves and lions, and, and you had very rudimentary weapons. And so, if you're going to defend your sheep against lions, then you were the sort of person who could defend sheep against lions. And that's no joke. And so, and that's useful to know. In any case, Cain and Abel make sacrifices to God, which is kind of a mystery. It's a mystery for modern people because we don't know what this means to build an altar and to burn something and to offer, offer the burnt remnants to God. Well, it's to offer something to God. It's the acting out of an idea, right? The, and it's a deep idea. It's the idea of work itself because work itself is sacrifice. It's a deeper idea than that. The idea is that in order to get something that you need and want in the future, you have to let go of something you value in the present. And that's the discovery of the future. So this idea of sacrifice that's put forth in, so early in this document is, uh, it's, it's a representation of what might be the second most fundamental discovery that human beings ever made, is that we can alter our behavior in the present so that the future would change. That's a hell of a thing to discover. It is literally the discovery of possibility itself. And the thing about it is it's actually true, or at least we all act as if it's true. You do give things up in the present so that the future can be better. You do actually act out the idea that reality is structured such that if you bargain with it properly, you will avoid punishment and receive, and receive what's good. It's a negotiation and it's an act of trade. And the strange thing is that it actually works. Now, part of the reason that it works is because you're actually negotiating with future people and your future self. And so there is a personified element to reality in that manner, but it's deeper than that. But we can leave it at that. And so people had to act this out before they could understand it. We, we can hardly understand it now. You know, I ask my students, well, did your parents make sacrifices so that you could go to university? They're often children of first generation immigrants and they can just reel off the sacrifices. And everyone knows what this means. But when we see it transposed, you know, several thousand years into the past, and, and we see it manifested itself in its more archaic form, like, like, like the pretend play that children engage in, in some sense, we, there's a disjunction and we don't understand. But the idea is fairly straightforward. Well, there, there's, some, there's some ultimate structure of reality. Where might you encounter that? Well, how about the sky? Well, why would you think that? Well, go out and look at the sky at night and see how you feel. And see that that produces a sense of awe at, 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 at the realization of infinity itself. And believer or non-believer, that emotion is there. And so why not put the divine in the unknown like that? It's perfectly reasonable. And then, so God inhabits the celestial spheres. Fine. How do you communicate? Well, smoke rises. Well, so you burn something. And it, it offers up the essence to whatever resides up there. It's a little bit on the concretized side, but it's not so bad for a first pass approximation, a first pass abstraction of the idea of sacrifice itself as, as a fundamental moral necessity. We, we had to discover that somehow. And so Cain makes his sacrifices and Abel makes his sacrifices. And Abel is very careful in his sacrifices and he takes the best of what he has and he sacrifices that. Which means he puts his best foot forward. That's what it means. Whereas Cain, well, we're never too sure. And the story is a bit ambivalent. And it should be. Because, you know, it might be that... Because there's some, something about life that's somewhat arbitrary. And it isn't obvious always that those who put their best foot forward are justly rewarded. And those who fail to do so are justly punished, right? There's an arbitrary element. And so there's some ambivalence about Cain. But you get the sense from the story that he isn't putting his best foot forward. Far from it. And what happens, well, what happens to Abel is everything good happens to him. And every time something good happens, then something even more good happens. Because what do they say? From those who have nothing, everything will be taken. And to those who have 
everything more will be given. And that's already played out in the story of Abel. You do things right, and then things start to happen in a good way, and then that starts to multiply, and up you go. And then, but if you take the other pathway, let's say, and you don't make the proper sacrifices, and you hold back what's best because you think you can get away with it, or because you don't think it's necessary, or because you're not willing to make the effort, or whatever it might be, then it goes from bad to worse very, very rapidly. That's exactly what happens to Cain. And he's not very happy about it. And so he decides to have it out with God. And it's no bloody wonder. And so he confronts God. He says, and he says something like this. What's up with this universe that you created? I'm breaking myself in half down here. Trying to struggle forward against the impossible odds that you've, you've laden me with. And, and nothing's going well for me. And then... The, there's Abel, your darling. And everything works out for him. Everyone likes him. Everything he touches works out. It's like, what, what the hell is going on here? And God says to him something that took me a long time to understand. I had to look at a lot of different translations and think this through for a long time to understand what it meant. God says something like, sin personified. Sin, that means to miss the target, by the way. Sin crouches at your door like a, an amorous and aroused predatory animal. And you've chosen to invite it in so that it can have its way with you in, a, in, a, in the creative sense that that amorous arousal would, would indicate metaphorically. That you've invited something in that you can join with creatively and produce something as a consequence. And what you've produced is not a good thing. And that's why things aren't going well for you. And that's the end of the discussion. And it says in the story that Cain's countenance fell. It's like, yes, well, you can imagine that it might. Because of all the things that you don't want to find out when you put a complaint like that forward to God is that it's your doing or your not doing that's bringing it about. And so what's Cain's reaction? Well, it should be. What should it be? It should be to shut himself up in a cave for a month and think very carefully about everything that he's done in his entire life that's wrong and put it right. But that isn't what happens. What happens is he finds Abel and he kills him. And why does he do that? Well, every ideal is a judge. How about that? Abel is actually what Cain would like to be. And worse, knows that he could be if he had chosen to be. And the pain of that is so great, let's say, the pain of that gap between the, the ideal and the reality is so great that Cain chooses instead to destroy his own ideal out of spite against God for the conditions of existence. And that's the story of human malevolence. Well, Cain calls, tells God that the pain of what he's done is too great for him to bear. It's not clear exactly what that means, but perhaps it does mean that he realizes that he's destroyed his own ideal and therefore has nothing left. And God marks him and tells people to leave him be. And I think the reason for that, at least in part, is it's an indication of the, the lack of utility for a cycle of revenge. But it doesn't matter because then Cain has offspring. And if you bother, if you disturb if you transgress against one of Cain's sons, then seven of you die. And if you transgress against one of Cain's grandsons, then 49 of you die. And then his, his descendant, approximately next in line, is Tubal Cain. And he's the first person who makes weapons of war. And so there's that idea there, right? Lurking in that story that not only is there this Cain and Abel drama that exists it's a fundamental part of human nature. That's the hostile brothers. That's the two forms of reaction to, to self-consciousness itself. But that the Cain-like response multiplies and is fundamentally responsible for the catastrophes of war. And that seems to me to be precisely accurate. Well, so, then the question is, well, is there something that can be done about it? Maybe I'll go one more place before I do that. I recently wrote the foreword to 
the abridged version of Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago, that was just published today, conveniently enough. And I was thinking about why the Russian Revolution went so terribly when it was predicated, at least in principle, on compassion for the dispossessed. It's not so easy to have compassion for the dispossessed. It's easy to claim compassion for the dispossessed, but to segregate that from hatred for the successful, let's say, or maybe more to segregate that from hatred for the good and justly rewarded is no straightforward thing. So I'm going to read you something from the foreword. The Russian Revolution became bloody very rapidly. It wasn't that there was a pristine period where the poor were treated properly and, and then over time the structure of the revolution became corrupt. It was exceedingly murderous right from the beginning, which might lead you to conclude that it was exceedious, exceedingly murderous motivations that dominated right from the beginning, despite the claim. So, Solzhenitsyn cites, for example, one Martin Latsis writing for the newspaper, Red Terror, November 1st, 1918. We are not fighting against single individuals. We are exterminating the bourgeoisie as a class. It is not necessary during the interrogation to look for evidence proving that the accused opposed the Soviets by word or action. The first question you should ask him is, what class does he belong to? What is his origin, his education, and his profession? These are the questions that will determine the fate of the accused. Such is the sense and essence of red terror. It is necessary to think when you read such a thing, to meditate long and hard on the message. It is necessary to recognize, for example, that the writer believed that it would be better to execute 10,000 potentially innocent individuals than to allow one poisonous member of the oppressor class to remain free. It is equally necessary to pose the question, who precisely belonged to that hypothetical entity, the bourgeoisie. It is not as if the boundaries of such a category are self-evident, there for the mere perceiving. They must be drawn. But where, exactly, more importantly, by whom, or by what? If it's hate inscribing the lines instead of love, they will inevitably be drawn so that lowest, meanest, most cruel and useless of the conceptual geographers will be justified in manifesting the greatest possible evil and producing the greatest possible misery. Members of the bourgeoisie? Beyond all redemption, they had to go as a matter of course. What of their wives? Children even their grandchildren, off with their heads too. All were incorrigibly corrupted by their class identity and their destruction, therefore ethically necessitated. <coughs> How convenient that the darkest and direst of all possible motivations could be granted the highest of moral standings. That was a true marriage of hell and of heaven. What values? What philosophical presumptions truly dominated under such circumstances? Was it the desire for brotherhood, dignity, and freedom from want? Not in the least, given the outcome. It was instead, and obviously, the murderous rage of hundreds of thousands of biblical canes, each looking to torture, destroy, and sacrifice their own private Abel's. There is simply no other manner of accounting for the corpses. And it is exactly the necessity for interminable sacrifice that constitutes the terrible counterpart of the utopian vision. Heaven is worth any price. But who pays?